At Scarborough, we believe that education comes first. We make our mark every day. Scarborough, a great place to learn. Go Lancers! Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Olathe School Board to order, the September 7th, 2006. Uh, Mrs. Carpenter, would you please call the roll? Ms. Ashley? Here. Mr. Churchman? Here. Dr. Bowman? Here. Mr. Gilmore? Here. Mr. Parker? Here. Mr. Poland? Here. Mrs. Wilhelm? Yes, here. <laughs> and we have a quorum to conduct our business tonight. And with that, Dr. Raw, would you introduce our guest for the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I would be happy to. Uh, tonight we have two students from Oregon Trail Junior High here to lead us in our pledge, uh, how we traditionally start our meetings. And uh, we have uh, Vanessa Michelle and Marley Winsky, and we're going to start the pledge, and then I'll give you a little biography on the young ladies after they've done their pledge, and they have a few people to introduce here. So with that, would you please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First of all, I'm going to take Marley, right? We've got Marley here. And Marley, according to her principles, is as a superstar in the performing arts department at Oregon Trail. She's active in the drama department. She's been in most play casts within the drama department and is also a member of the Oregon Trail Drama Club. And we've had a great dramatic conversation prior to this meeting, I can tell you. <laughs> she's a member of the advanced choir. Uh, she's also in both concert and jazz bands at Oregon Trail. We can see that fine arts is sort of her area of interest and passion. She maintains a high GPA and is a taking an advanced English placement class this year, uh, beginning a four-year preparation program for the AP uh, English test during her senior year that we're preparing for. And uh, Marley has whom with you tonight? I have my mom, Leslie Bills, right there in the yellow thing, and um, <laughs> my principal, Mr. Massey. And this is Vanessa Michelle, and uh, Vanessa is also a member of the band. Uh, she plays the trombone. She's also a member of the jazz band. She participates in that. And I can tell you that both of these young ladies uh, are going to be leaving here shortly because the Oregon Trail band will be marching through the Oregon Trail neighborhoods tonight yet uh, to share their music with their community. And it's an extra practice to get ready for Old Settlers on Saturday morning, which is a longstanding tradition in Olathe. And Mar uh, Michelle, I'm sorry, Vanessa is also a member of the art club. So we have these fine art students here and the drama club. And her favorite class, which I'm very proud to say, is mathematics. And uh, both girls have told me that right now, as of this moment, they're straight A students. So we're going to, <laughs> so we're going to keep that up for the remainder of the year. We're very proud of both of these young ladies. And would you like to introduce who you have with you? Um, yes, with me I have my mom. She's in the white, Norma Michelle, and also my principal, Mr. Massey. Well, thank you, ladies, very much. Appreciate you being here tonight and your families, and uh, Mr. Massey, and thank you for doing the Pledge of Allegiance for us tonight. Dr. All, would you uh, be so kind as to do an overview of our agenda this evening, please? Yes, I would be happy to. First of all, we'll begin with presentations. Uh, we're going to open with the beginning of the 2006-07 school year, which we had a very smooth opening, and so you're going to hear more about what it takes to do that. Uh, we're going to have an update on our summer school, uh, I'm sorry, summer projects. Uh, our uh, service center staff has been working very hard to get schools ready. Uh, there will be a report on a new procedural manual for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And then there will be a report on some of the changes in the Kansas Adequate Yearly Progress, AYP. That's a foundation as we're moving forward for this year and understanding um, that whole process. And then uh, President Gilmore will give a brief update on the Joint City Council and School Board meeting that was held a couple weeks ago, the first ever in the history of these two entities. Uh, following uh, our presentations, we'll take a comfort break 
and about 6.45, we'll come back for recognitions and awards. There's a variety of staff and student awards uh, that are going to happen this evening. And then at 7 o'clock, uh, the board takes public comments. Um, and following public comments, the board will begin action items. The first section will be the consent agenda, of which the board has received material prior uh, to this uh, agenda. Uh, the board may approve these items without detailed discussion, but any item may be removed for separate discussion or separate vote by the superintendent or any board member. Following the consent agenda, uh, there will be action items related to setting a special meeting date in September uh, to uh, do follow-up discussion on growth and bond task force uh, findings. Following that item, there are a, a series of future action items. This is information provided to the board that at some time in the future will require action by the board, and the board president will identify those when we get to those in the agenda. And then there are uh, several written reports that the board does receive as informational items to assist them with their awareness of what's happening in the school district. The board will adjourn to accept uh, executive session, and uh, we will recess to consult with attorney on matters deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship. And following that will be adjournment. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rall. First item on our agenda tonight, board members, section uh, 2.01 is a report on the beginning of the 2006-07 school year, and I believe Dr. Banikowski is going to present this item. Good evening. Good evening. It's my privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the beginning of this new school year. And, and here we are, and children across this district had the opportunity to join us just ever so recently to start a new school year. <coughs> and I think all of us can remember back to those starts of the new school year. I did run into a parent last evening at a function that indicated he and his wife were very excited about school starting. And uh, he said, in addition, my children were too. So I was glad to hear both we're positive about that. But certainly as we think about the beginning of a school year, we can think about the fact that we're here to serve a lot of customers. And I think this picture kind of shows a lot that Mr. Carpenter had uh, provided to me. We have lots of students and an opportunity to work with all these customers in starting a new school year. As we look at it, we know that our enrollment continues to grow. And of course, we don't have any exact numbers yet because we're waiting for that magic September 20th count. But this is what we have to date, and uh, we're constantly updating that information. But as you can see, we're projecting a 900 student increase, and uh, Mr. Grollop uh, indicates that's what we're looking at for this coming school year. So our graph continues to go up as we service the needs of our community. As we look at some of those preliminary numbers that were provided, you can see that we have a great number of new students at the elementary level, some at the junior high level, and another group of new students at uh, additional students at the senior high level. Certainly, we also know that our students have to get to school, and uh, busing is an important aspect of the program that we provide here in the school district. And you can see the number of routes that we provide, both regular routes and special routes. You can see the number of students that we're transporting on a daily basis, and that's quite amazing. And the number of pay riders, as well as a new payment option that was provided <coughs> through Laid Law this year, an online credit card payment. So those are some of the features of getting our students to school so that we can again provide them an education. Health service is another important part of the beginning of the school year and making sure that we have new nurses on board because health services is also a part of the program that we provide, a support program that we provide for our students here in the district. You can see our nurses have been updating their skills, going to conferences, making sure that they are also educating the public. And you can see where our health coordinator, Cindy Gailmore, was actually on public radio and also featured in a magazine. And you can also see that they're also providing updates to staff, such in the area of CPR and how important that is for our staff to be educated in that skill should the need arise. We also know that we need to feed our students, and uh, I know for myself personally, eating is a very important part of my life, and that's also a very important part of our students' life. And Mr. Kingery provided information on the, the breakfasts that we're serving daily, the lunches we're serving daily, and you can see that that represents a 20% increase from the same time last year, as we have more students and more students eating. Certainly, we also will hear uh, further information from Mr. Houghton and his staff regarding our quality facilities. We have some new facilities that opened that uh, we had the opportunity to impact and, and construct. And also, we've had a lot of uh, pro 
capital outlay projects in some of our existing facilities. You see 172 there. We have schools that are under construction. And in fact, I love this last name. We've touched nearly every building through the service center and our maintenance and our improvements in those buildings and providing that facilities needed for good quality instruction. Certainly, we've also had a lot of technology, and, and it, it looks like a lot on this screen. I think as you look at it and look at some of the specifics, as you know that technology is an integral part of our organization for both the workers in the, that organization as well as the students in that organization. Everything from replacing uh, desktops and laptops and infrastructure, uh, making sure that we prepared Harmony Early Childhood Learning Center for all the technology that they would need for staff and students. Certainly looking at, uh, right now, looking at Regency Place's new construction and making sure we're ready to add the technology needed there. So we've had a wide variety of opportunities that our technology department has been working on to help us have a good beginning of the school year and a smooth beginning of the school year. Certainly our Human Resources Department has been very diligent and very busy in preparing to have staff on board as we greet our new students this year. As you look at the number of cer new certified staff members and classified staff members we have, that's a big, large number. Many organizations don't have that many individuals in their entire organization, and these are just our newly hired individuals. You can see that we've had to fill temporarily some of our certified positions uh, with uh, substi long-term substitutes, and you can see that number there. I'm pleased to say that in the area of special education, we have many more people hired this year than we started with last year. We don't have the number of long-term subs that we started with last year, and that's, that's kudos to lots of people working together on that. We still have work to do in the HR department. We still have some uh, specially classified positions that we're working on, and you can see those numbers up there. But look at that number, 97% of the total number of classified positions have been filled, and that's kudos to a, a great team effort. Certainly we know the teaching learning department and lots of folks have been preparing to uh, have a successful beginning of the school year. We had multiple summer projects going on. Uh, a lot of people think in the summer that everybody's kind of uh, sit back and relax and just wondering what you're doing. But we have teachers across this district involved in multiple projects in preparation to have a smooth beginning of the school year. For example, we have teachers that are working on math lessons and so that we can start off a, a smooth start of the year. But we've had multiple projects across this district, and I heard Luann Hermer today reference those, that without those projects during the summer, we would not have that beginning smooth start that we do have. We certainly also have a lot of professional development that we're involved in, both in pre-service with our new educators, all our educators on August the 11th. We also have to prepare for students in making sure textbooks and instructional materials are on site. And that's no small task in a district our size. Uh, it used to be you had lots of things sitting around on a shelf or you could just order from a textbook company to be here in the next day. They don't keep things on their shelves either. So it's orchestrating a lot to make sure our students have the text and instructional materials that they need. And certainly we did a lot of work to prepare for some learning initiatives that we're working on this year. Uh, elementary international language, certainly well versed in that. Certainly our AVID pilot has been something that's taken a lot of work, a lot of staff training this summer. Staff training just was occurring the other day that Dr. Shirk and Dr. Sanders uh, organized. All those things have to happen in order for us to have a smooth start to the school year. And oftentimes when we're implementing pilots, it means that we're implementing something that we don't have all the bugs worked out because that's why you do a pilot. So a lot of people work very diligently to prepare for that smooth start. Well, you know, you think about it, we kind of take it for granted that you had a smooth, we had a smooth start to the school year. And, you know, we're just about happening upon old settlers. And that means, that means, gosh, we're back in school and things are going pretty smoothly and pretty soon we're going to see the band students walking down the street. But that didn't just happen by accident. It took a lot of strategic planning, a very proactive approach. We certainly had to focus on our customers, our students and families. Everyone had to do their personal best, and we had to have a very highly functioning team in order to make that accomplished. You know, our, uh, as you know, our theme this year from Dr. All is Dare to Dream. We individually and collectively must reach for excellence, reach for those stars if we're going to make our dreams a reality. And I think we're off to a very good start for the 2006-2007 school year. I'd like those people that are here that contributed to this, we just thought it'd be faster if only one person did it, uh, with Stan that helped to come off with a really great bang to the 2006-2007 uh, school year, real smooth operation. Stand up if you helped to make that happen. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Also, you saw on your agenda those who had contributed to the PowerPoint, and they would stand ready to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Manikowski. Board members, any question or comments? I'll make a comment to Dr. All and to the staff. I mean, uh, I'm going to speak first as a parent and as a board member second. It couldn't have been smoother. Just kudos to everybody for the job that they did. Uh, and I know it takes a tremendous amount of work and it doesn't just happen. Like it says here, a highly functioning team. Just uh, my thanks to everything that the, the team did. I just wanted to ask, what is the grade six and seven math pilot? Um, I don't seem to recall what that is. We had a, uh, actually two references. We had board reports last year on this, but with all the things that are going on, it's hard to remember. We have some pilots, elementary and junior high schools that feed each other that are looking at a potential change in our curriculum and sequence change. In some districts in the United States, students at eighth grade take algebra, whereas our students predominantly take that in the ninth grade. So we're looking at um, increasing the rigor and the acceleration of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math and uh, looking at a new pi project uh, program to make that happen. We've had uh, teachers in those pilot schools working diligently this summer along with district staff to see if that is something that would be successful for our students. You might remember also that we had both Title I schools uh, that are participating as well as non-Title I schools so that we have some uh, good information to see is this something our students can handle in the Olathe School District as we look at a curriculum change. Thank and you. you'll be having an update on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful report. Agenda item 2.02, .02, Operations Service Center Summer Updates. Mr. Jim Houghton is going to present this item to us. I'm proud tonight to represent the men, the women, and the contractors of the service center to give you a very brief update of situations that occurred this summer. This summer, we managed to complete one major project for every two hours. This does not include work orders, preventing maintenance, and the normal <clears throat> maintenance things that are accomplished. We completed 172 projects in 368 hours, spent nearly $3 million in doing this particular situation. To be very honest, $3 million represents what our entire budget was the year before in order to accomplish some of these upgrades. These are a listing of the schools that major asphalt and concrete projects were done. We did not list the little ones where you put in a sidewalk, so forth. These were our major projects that we tackled. This is the major places where we put in casework. Casework is in lieu of the standalone furniture that you'll find in many of their classrooms. Most of these schools had most of their casework replaced. The thing we tried to lean on the hardest this particular time was the flooring projects. This includes carpeting and a new method that Greg came up with when he started a couple elementary schools. It's a hard surface flooring that will eliminate the staining, makes it easier for Tustodians to clean. In my opinion, it makes the halls a lot brighter. Problem is there's only two companies and we tie them up for the entire summer. so. We would like to get some more done, but these are the major schools that we went in and did flooring projects in. And then, of course, painting. These are what the ones we tackled mainly where we painted most of the schools. We try to get some painting in most of the elementary schools, try to assist in the junior highs and senior highs. Uh, it's nice that the senior highs and junior high principals help us out. We buy the paint and they sort of get some of their people to help. But here are some of the schools that we put in the major painting on. Reroofing, which was a lot of the money, I wish it could be longer, but these are the three that we spent our time on. I think it's south that we spent most of the summer reroofing most of that particular school. Miscellaneous projects, of course, we work on these particular situations, different things that principals request, different things that senior leadership decides that we ought to look at. We tried to come up with some pictures. It's kind of difficult to show you a roof because, you know, a roof's a roof. However, we're real proud of this one. This was in Lathe South. If you ever went by Lathe South, it looked like we owned most of the company with all the material sitting out there. We took over the big parking lot and everything else. They had the big cranes out. This one's real easy to see. We reworked the gym at Black Bob. This is a result of what we had. 
Indian Trail. This is the school that we put a lot of emphasis on last year through the school year. It was sort of our pilot school to see if we could actually work through the school year. Because obviously as we get bigger and the few days we have in the summer, it doesn't leave us much time. So working with their administration, we managed to do a lot of the projects on the weekends and at night when school was in session. This is one of the long halls. This is part of what you can do with the hall. Once again, it's kind of difficult, you know, the kids need the lockers. A lot of them are not in good shape, but we were real pleased with this particular locker setup that we put in at Indian Trail. Santa Fe, this is their auditorium. They have not had a revision of an auditorium for years and years, and so we went in and redid their entire auditorium over the summer. Olathe North, if you can remember going to the Culinary Arts Department, they have a very nice program up there. We were asked to try to design something that would make it a little more impressive when you walked in instead of just the, quote, wood door. So some of our people came up with this, and we had this installed. What's important to us is we work off of a CIP program, a capital improvement program. This is a little different than the city. They list all their big projects. We list all of our projects by school. All of this is found on the uh, virtual file cabinet. This tells us, as an example in this school, Fairview, this tells us exactly what we would like to do based on about two weeks ago. As projects come in, they're at it. We take an educated guess on what the cost is going to be. We determine which administrator will be in charge of it. We decide what year we think we can get it done in. And then as it gets done, we turn around and mark that one particular off. This one does not reflect, as an example, any bond situations, but this is one of the schools we worked on last year. This is a school we're putting some emphasis on. If you'll notice a number of the 2006s, we will get these projects done during the school year. And we've worked with the principals, we have the stuff in, we're figuring out how we're gonna do it. And this shows you what we intend to accomplish. Now this changes sometimes on a daily basis, most of the time on a weekly basis. Sometimes we get a little aggressive and think we can do a lot of things and some of the projects slow us down so we gotta sort of rearrange some of them. This shows you what we intended to do this year, what we'll get done this year, and what we have scheduled for the rest of the years. The problem with this report is really this is just the beginning because here is where our future projects are and the locations of our major projects that we intend to tackle in the next several years. And when we get to capital outlay, we ask for requests from the schools, they will give us more items, we'll go out and look at them, we'll find items like roofs and air conditionings and things that we'll add to our list. Any questions I might answer for you. Jim, Thank you, how Mr. Did the project work, uh, Indian Trail, where you're working through the school year, did that, that something that you'd like be able to do? Well, considering it's the first time we tried it, <clears throat> we had a few problems. We decided at night we could do certain things, and luckily the administration and the students and teachers were very nice. Sometimes we'd get it torn down and halfway put up, but we got better toward the end. We figured out what we could do over a weekend and so forth. We're so used to working with the children there on a lot of things that it was sort of amazing how fast we moved at night, but it worked very well. We got a lot of things accomplished that we would not. And with this school, we've determined that we've got to figure out a system with our contractors and our people to work at nights, to work on the long weekends, to work over different vacation periods to try to get it done. And it was very nice of Indian Trail. They really didn't volunteer, but. It was very nice of them to work with us. And so we're working at Santa Fe, and that's going a lot smoother in that we sort of worked out our problems at Indian Trail. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Houghton. I, I can just, yeah. Mr. Pollan, go ahead. Greg, on, on the flooring, what, uh, what, tell us a little bit about it. Why is it better? Is it, what did we have before? Do we expect longer life, more cost effective over the years? One of the things I discovered not long after being here is that uh, in the corridors, the schools that had carpet didn't like it. The schools that had tile didn't like it. <laughs> so that we obviously need to be looking for another material. And uh, we had used a product, it's a single, it's a um, seamless epoxy flooring. It's put down as a liquid. Uh, we've been using it in our restrooms for many years and, and considered it rather expensive. It, it worked nice in restrooms and locker rooms. They developed another product that was sort of at the lower price end um, 
that we tried in a couple of small locations. Then I think we tried it at California Trail. It worked okay. Had maybe decided maybe a different color, different texture might work better. We tried it again then at Prairie Trail. Worked better. Uh, and then we really hit upon probably the final coating at uh, Ravenwood. Everyone really seemed to like it there, and we've put it in some of the athletic areas that sort of that athletic corridor at the junior high schools that take so much abuse, and we're going to try it there. It is a single. Uh, the great thing the custodians like about it is not only can you not wax it, it doesn't need to be waxed, and you can't wax it. So it really reduces the maintenance, allows custodians more, uh, more uh, time to deal with other issues in the building. We're expecting it to last as long as tile, um, certainly longer than carpet, uh, but, but, but it's still sort of in the test period with us. You know, I don't think- Is no, it an epoxy like, product also? Excuse is me? Is it an epoxy product also? It is a single, it is a, a multi-step, but it is a liquid applied uh, seamless epoxy. Just on the floor, does it go up part of the walls too? Uh, in, in locker room locations, we run it up the wall uh, for health reasons and sanitation reasons. In, in our corridors, we use rubber base, just like you would do carpet or tile. It's cheaper. Yeah. Uh, when you turn it up the walls, that's the, really the expensive part of the flooring. So we really just use it on the floor and we use a rubber base on the walls, just like you would with carpet or tile. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Next on our agenda is procedural manual, item 2.03, procedural manual for section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And Mr. Jerry Renaud is going to present this for us. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, tonight I'm going to present and introduce to you uh, the new section 504 manual for uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, this is a copy of the procedural manual itself. And uh, <clears throat> I first want to address uh, credits for this. Uh, I can only lay credit to the first five or ten drafts. Uh, I lost count. And uh, since then, uh, I've had 21 people involved in the review of this manual uh, for their expertise and their opinions. Uh, they are special services administrators, coordinators, a consultant, building level administrators, staff counsel, board attorney, parents, the 504 building representatives, and uh, last but not least, input from the Office of Civil Rights. So we are very proud to introduce this um, manual to you tonight. Uh, basically, uh, Section 504 is a law passed in 1973 that prohibits the discrimination uh, against individuals with disabilities. <clears throat> and we'll hear more about the details of that. One of the things that I noted, uh, that we went from the manual we were using, which I, I will mention momentarily, from a two-inch manual to a one-inch manual. So uh, we are all about paperwork reduction and also trying to produce a product that is user-friendly user to our staff and to our parents. Why the focus on Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act uh, after 33 years? First of all, we want to create public awareness for this regulation. And uh, secondly, the Kansas Department of Education changed their practice in providing uh, some resources for local school districts in Kansas. They had developed a manual, which was the two inch or closer to three inch manual a number of years ago, but uh, decided that because they had no legal responsibility to uh, monitor this law, that they relinquished their responsibility and turned uh, the complaints uh, over to the Office of Civil Rights where they belonged. So the Kansas Department of Education, while they would still provide information regarding this law, would uh, c continue to uh, make referrals to the Office of Civil Rights. When they stop providing the resources, the regulations really require local school districts to develop procedures and policies related to Section 504 and how we will implement that. Uh, in the near future, you will be uh, uh, provided an opportunity to approve a new policy in regards to uh, federal regulations governing children with disabilities. Uh, Scott Mason and I are currently working on that, and that will roll out hopefully in a month or so. Uh, secondly, uh, Section 504 in its early inception 
was really mainly focused on employment. Uh, it was not too many years ago that the application of this law uh, began to apply to education and to focus on non-discrimination in education uh, institutions uh, who receive federal funding uh, to not dis to dis uh, eliminate discrimination against individuals based upon their disability as that is defined in this law. The three main laws that uh, give protection to individuals with disabilities in the United States are the IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Briefly, IDEA is really a funded law. Gary Diener and I call it the poorly funded law. Uh, it requires a free appropriate public education uh, with specially designed instruction uh, and procedural safeguards. It is monitored by uh, or enforced by the Office of Special Education Programs of the Department of Education of the United States government. And it is monitored by the Kansas Department of Education. It was recently amended in 2004, but it has taken this long to get new regulations, and they came out about four weeks ago. So my staff and I are beginning to navigate uh, the new regulations for IDEA. ADA was a law passed in 1990, uh, and it was passed by Congress to uh, eliminate discrimination against individuals with disabilities in the employment sector, uh, public accommodations, transportation, and telecommunications. It is monitored by the Office of Civil Rights. And now back to Section 504. It is important to understand that it is a civil rights law. It is not an education law. Uh, it requires accommodations in general education for individuals who qualify as disabled under the definition of this law. I offer a comparison of IDEA in Section 504 as a strategy for advancing the understanding of disability law as it relates to education. IDEA is a uh, education law. Section 504 is a civil rights law. IDEA is a federally funded law. Section 504 has no funding. IDEA defines 13 <coughs> different ca uh, disability categories and Section 504 has a specific definition which states that an individual is disabled under this law if they have a mental or physical condition that substantially limits a major life activity, has a record of a disability, or is believed to have a disability, a three-pronged definition. Major life activities are defined also in the law as such thing as caring for oneself, walking, seeing, hearing, and in our case, learning. <clears throat> uh, the require, IDA requires specialized instruction, as in special education, uh, by certified staff. <coughs> Section 504 requires accommodations in general education. Continuing with the relationship strategy, IDEA evaluations are comprehensive. Section 504 evaluations can be based upon existing information. IDEA regula regulations uh, require notice and consent from parents, while Section 504 only requires notice. However, there are also procedural safeguards to accompany that notice. IDEA requires an IEP, that is an Individualized Education Program. Section 504 requires an accommodation plan. The Olathe District School Procedural Manual has many components to it, uh, even though it is only a one-inch binder. Uh, it is designed to assist building teams in making relevant decisions and determining eligibility under this law. Uh, it includes 38 pages of content uh, com covering key elements of the regulations. Those elements are such things as I've mentioned before, the procedural requirements, the parent rights, <coughs> disabilities defined, parents in the process, referral evaluation, eligibility determination, 
and appendix form, uh, which are forms and additional resources. One of the things that is in this particular bind uh, manual is uh, Appendix G, and it is a parent handbook. Uh, and we are particularly excited about this handbook because we think it will advance not only our staff's understanding but our parents' understanding of this regulation and for them to be, be able to differentiate whether or not they feel a referral is appropriate. <clears throat> you have a copy of that particular uh, handbook and uh, that is for your keeping. Uh, I would highly recommend though that if anybody asks for a copy that you refer them to my office in case along the way there are additional changes before we go to print of massive numbers to uh, accommodate uh, the demand for this product. In closing, I would say that uh, we have a training schedule uh, uh, in the works that will uh, happen between now and the end of October in which we will train all staff who have the responsibility for uh, knowledge of this law and the implementation process. And uh, I will entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Renaud. Any questions or comments, board members? Sounds like it's just getting simpler all the time, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Disability law is so exciting. <laughs> how, and Mr. Renaud, how and who identifies a student who may have the potential to have a 504? A accommodation plan developed for them. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. How and who identifies a student that may potentially okay. have a 504 plan and the accommodation that's okay. drawn for that plan? Uh, a building level team, and that team is similar to uh, a student intervention team, it's similar to an IEP team. It, uh, in the regulations, they require that individuals who have knowledge of the child. Uh, make decisions in regards to uh, their eligibility for uh, <coughs> services under this regulation. The building team generally would re uh, consist of the building uh, principal, the counselor, the building 504 representative uh, who we give special additional training to, uh, the classroom teacher, and uh, others who may have an interest uh, or a knowledge of the child, and, and particularly the parent, is involved in the team process. Would a medical profession or a parent also be a person who medical identifies? Medical professionals are uh, a, a key uh, referral source and evaluation source for children who are eligible under this law, especially in the areas of uh, allergic conditions that require special medical uh, intervention as well as uh, attention deficit disorder that requires uh, special uh, accommodations at school, uh, possibly medication which we don't involve ourselves in but sometimes only in the administration of that medication. Is the revisitation of that plan a yearly process or determined by the team? It is an annual review. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Item 2.04 on our agenda is regarding changes in the Kansas Adequate Yearly Progress requirements. And Dr. Batikowski is going to present this item and Ms. Matthews. Thank you. We're pleased to have the opportunity to share with you about some of the challenges and changes in AYP, Adequate Yearly Progress. And as you might remember, we have certainly talked about No Child Left Behind in the past, or NCLB, and talked about the, the law that was enacted in 2002 and some of the implications of that law and some of the carrying out of that law for the different states. As we have discussed in the past, we certainly have, uh, they have wonderful premises behind No Child Left Behind, very laudable and important premises that all of us espouse and agree with as we look at certainly having all children obtain a high quality education. That would be something that agrees and aligns with our philosophy here in the district. As we look at No Child Left Behind, we know that there's something that's very important part of No Child Left Behind, that's AYP, because we needed some more acronyms in education. Uh, and we know that AYP stands for Adequate Yearly Progress. And that means the percentage of students that are scoring on state assessments at the proficient level or above. 
You might also remember with No Child Left Behind, it set the goal that by 2013, all students in the United States would be scoring proficient or above. We also have to remind ourselves, because uh, as we uh, sometimes forget the pieces of No Child Left Behind and AYP in our public, trying to understand this law, that each, dis each state helped to develop or select their own assessments, so there's not comparability across states, and they also set their own criteria for AYP, what they would determine as being adequate in a yearly basis up to 2013, where we all will hit the 100% expectation. So that's a good reminder for us as we think about that. Certainly we also know in Kansas they set their requirement for what AYP would be defined. They submitted that to the federal government and it was approved. Uh, they, number one, a very important part is that all students and student groups, which we'll talk about a little bit later, must meet or exceed the identified percentage of students scoring proficient or above. Secondly, 95% of the students, including each student group, must participate in the assessment. So you could not uh, have certain groups of students or certain students, you couldn't ask them to stay home on the day you were testing. This was to ensure that you tested the vast majority of your students. Uh, attendance rate was an important part of that for Kansas as well as graduation rate, and you can see those rates there. Last year at this time, uh, actually a little bit earlier than this time, we were sharing with you the highlights from the previous Kansas assessment, and we were doing a lot of celebrating. And we're talking about all Title I schools making AYP and all schools making AYP. And the improvement that we saw with the ELL and our English language learners, our special education students, and the number of schools that met the standard of excellence. However, this year we can't share that information with you at this time because we're going to, however, share with you the changes that have been occurring in the Kansas AYP program and the Kansas assessment program. So we wanted to make sure that you felt schooled in all the changes, some of which are as recent as a couple of weeks ago. So with that, Mary Matthew, our Director of School Improvement and Assessment, is going to provide us some of those details about the changes that have occurred. And you can see on your slide, we're going to talk about seven changes that have occurred. Mary? Thanks. And as we get ready, really, to talk about those changes, um, I think it's important that we start with the foundational things, and that works with the um, state standards. You approved last November our math curriculum. That math curriculum incorporated the new state standards, and those are the standards that our students would be tested on. Two years ago, a reading curriculum was approved based on new state standards. It's important that we keep that in mind because our old tests can't be compared to new tests because of the new state standards. Um, it's also important in terms of the resources. We had to make sure we had appropriate resources to match the new standards. We also had to make sure that we had staff trained on what the new standards and what the new tested indicators would look like. In addition to the new standards, we also tested more grade levels. In the past, we tested students at 5, 8, and 11 in the area of reading, 4, 7, and 10 in math. We now test all students in grades 3 through 8 for both reading and math. We test our 10th graders in the area of mathematics, and we've continued to test our 11th graders. Those are annual assessments that we give each spring. We also know that another change that occurred were the performance bands. And earlier when you heard Dr. Banikowski say that states have now had to determine what proficient uh, meant, our state, um, as recent as late August, decided that the current terms that we had, which were exemplary, advanced, proficient, basic, and unsatisfactory, were too confusing. They were confusing because they were um, often confused with the NAEP assessment, um, the National Assessment for Educational Progress Test that we give our students in the state of Kansas, and so they decided to change the labels. Our new labels now that are being attached to the performance bands in our students are exemplary exceed standard, meet standard, approach a standard, and academic warning. I will tell you that academic warning is one that as a district we're not in favor of. It is one that we are um, continuing to work with um, folks at the State Department to encourage them to make that change. It's really hard when you stop and think of saying to a 10-year-old, you're an academic warning. And so um, and as we work through this, this is an area that we know still needs to change. Uh, they did not ask for input from the field on those changes at the State Department. They just uh, fell upon us uh, in an email. In addition to uh, the different scoring bands, in the past we had uh, scoring bands at 4, uh, 7, 10, 5, 8, and 11. You can see on the chart in front of you, this happens to be the general reading uh, perform performance scoring bands. So in order for a student, for example, at grade three to meet standard, formerly known as being proficient, uh, students had to score between 67% and 79%. 
Um, as you look across the different grade levels, you'll see they're different at every grade. In addition to uh, what you see in front of you, there are scoring bands and standards for uh, the general assessment. There are standards for the CAM assessment, which is the Kansas Assessment of Multiple Measures, which Ms. Dugan will talk about in a minute. There are different standards for the alternate assessment. There are different assessments for math and each of those areas as well. So having a good understanding and a foundation for the scoring bands um, becomes a little tricky when it takes five pages of printed text. The other thing we um, think that's important because these are new assessments, it's always important to remember that these are not your basic skills assessments. These are tests that often challenge our students and are um, I think, in a way, um, good things that we want our kids to learn. You happen to see an example of a 10th grade problem. I know as I kind of looked at that, uh, from, if you want to know the answers, B, um, in case you're sitting there frantically trying to look at that scatter plot, thinking, okay, where is the bacteria in the colonies after nine hours? Um, the, the test questions really are challenging for both reading and math, and so I think uh, it's important that we kind of keep some of those uh, questions uh, in the forefront uh, as we, we think about these exams. In addition to the changes um, for the performance bands and in addition to the changes for the tests, we also have um, the target score. You may recall in the past we've provided you with a nice graph that showed where we needed to be. Uh, on August 21st, we received uh, an email from the State Department indicating at last, your new target scores have been found. And you can see on the screen that this year our students in grade K-8, 67.7% of our students had to meet standard or be proficient or higher uh, for AYP. And you can see for math. And they're different for our K-8 and for 9-12. Uh, probably a better visual uh, is the one that will hopefully pop up here. Maybe I'm going to click again. I might be clicking again. Oh. I guess they didn't show up. Let me go back and see if we can maybe get them. <laughs> I don't know, but it was a darn good graph. Really good Mary, it's it might really be because it's graph. a moving target. Pardon me? It could be because it's a moving target. It could be, Linda, that's excellent. <laughs> that was it very show, good. It didn't come up on our help. copy either. So. Didn't come up on your copy either. Well, we'll make sure that you get the um, really cool graph that shows the, the new steps to be proficient by uh, 2014. The stages before uh, were pretty incremental mm -hmm. about, um, in, in Kansas, we actually did take a nice approach of kind of having a stair-stepped approach um, we still have that stair-stepped approach, but it's a little bit higher and it gets a little bit more each year. We get there a little bit faster. So we will bring those uh, two particular graphs back to you, but those are additional changes that we have. They're on our slides, but we'll work on that. The, we, certainly we shared with you new state tests, more students tested, more grade levels, performance bands change, scores to get those performance band change, AYP target change. We have a couple other areas we want to let you know about and that's some testing requirement changes, first of all, for English language learners. Dr. Jan Heinen is our middle level uh, director but also facilitates our English language learner program. is going to talk to you a little bit about the changes that, are, that were instituted last spring when we hit our brand new Kansas assessments. Dr. Heinen? Thank you. Some of the changes that apply to ELL students across the district. Um, for Kansas assessment, both in reading and math at all the tested grade levels, um, included a change that, that required students to be tested at the same grade level um, as their um, English-speaking peers for both reading and math. Um, and, and this had, uh, this was a significant change for us, rather than be able to match their Kansas assessment with their reading levels. Um, to describe a little bit about what this um, what this felt like from the point of view of the perspective of an individual student. I want to tell you about a student who came to Olathe North last year. We'll call her Carolina. And she was enrolling in 10th grade last year, August 17th, as a 10th grader. And this was her first time in a U.S. school. She was a non-English speaking student, certainly a non-English reader. And she came to join us in Olathe North. Throughout her school year last year, five of her seven classes throughout the day were ELL, or English language learner classes. Uh, two of those hours devoted specifically to learning English. The other three devoted to content, science, social studies, and math, but taught by an ELL teacher who was indeed teaching English acquisition and listening, speaking, reading, and writing at the same time that she was teaching science, for instance. In her other two periods, she had physical education and an elective class. 
By spring, we were able to assess that Carolina had improved in her English just as we expected her to. Her reading had improved, her writing had improved in both composition skills and in English grammar skills. Her teachers describe Carolina as a typical teenager with interests that go beyond academics. Uh, they also describe her as being a very good student who does her homework and who attends to her studies. Uh, Carolina is now starting her 11th grade year, her second year with us, in a process that takes five to seven years, according to research, for learning English at an academic level. This year, Carolina is very excited about being in an art class, and her art teacher, Dr. Trapp, is very excited about having her in that class with, um, with other students. Carolina begins her 11th grade year reading at the first grade level. And we count that as a success for her first year in a U.S. school, for her first year in Olathe learning English, um, as I would count it a success if I had progressed that far in a new language in just 12 months. She's reading at a first grade level. In March of this year, Carolina will be required to take the, seventh, the same 11th grade reading test as all the other juniors in high school in Olathe and in the state of Kansas the same test that AP students are taking, uh, the same test as other students who have been certainly in U.S. schools since kindergarten and speaking English since infancy. This begins to measure, I think, from a personal point of view of a student's experience, uh, the challenges of Kansas assessment and AYP for ELL students, their teachers, and their families. Dr. Heinen, yes. uh, a question. Yes. Uh, I understand from what from what I understand about um, testing state assessments and uh, AYP and no child left, left behind each state establishes their own tests and each state sta establishes these benchmarks each state yeah. makes the determination uh, in regards to testing subgroups you're correct is that correct That's so right. for instance another state their requirement for testing an ELL student may not be as stringent as the state of Kansas. Is that a true take? Is that a, a, a true? Uh, yes, that's a true statement. And the entire assessment process, the, the test in that state themselves may be very mm -hmm. different. So basically, states. there's 50 different programs. Yes, sir. Uh, and um, it seems to me, looking at myself, I was in Germany for three years uh, and tried to acquire a little bit of language. So it's like taking a student from the 10th grade in, uh, in Olathe and taking them to Germany mm -hmm. and who had never experienced German and, or any other country for that matter, putting them in school for a year and then a year later testing them at the, and expecting them to be at the same level, someone who had been in, the, in that culture and that language for six, 17, 16, 17 years from, from infancy. It seems a little. It seems a stretch here, and um, I, I'm having difficulty trying to understand this and what what's driving this and how this how this was established and what's our reaction to it. And I understand that that, that all, every, every child can learn and every child should learn, and we need to be responsible to every child, and we need to work with every child. But yet, to, to, to have these sort of expectations of a child who's been here just a year seems to be, um, it's difficult for me to understand why that's like that and, and, and what's, what's the recourse here. You use the phrase, it seems like a stretch, and I'll say according to the research, it seems like a stretch as well. Uh, it takes five to seven years to learn a language I, I, at an academic level. I, I understand that, but what's our response? I mean, to, to the state, to the State Department of Education, what's our response? What's what do we say? Um, it, it appears to me like, how are we going to be able? It appears to me that I asked the question: Is how are we going to make AYP for English language learners we will, uh, with the, with this kind of a standard? It, it's a good question. We will certainly continue to. Um, to try with, with all the um, instructional research that we know. Um, we certainly have contacted our State Department representatives and, and other representatives at the federal level to let them know our feelings about this. We've had opportunities to do that, and we've taken those opportunities. I think we'll need to continue to take those opportunities. Uh, I'm wondering if, 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 if there should be a concern on behalf of the board um, if, if we should have some kind of uh, response, albeit measured, but uh, some kind of of indication to the State Department that this just t t 
to me, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm all wrong here, but it seems unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I think you, uh, we, uh, as Dr. Heine said, we have continued to provide our input. Uh, this is from the federal government, and we would need to uh, have the response there because many times our State Department would indicate to us that they are just implementing what has been approved or not approved by the federal government. Uh, we have given that input. Dr. George has been instrumental in helping us get that to the inf people that are looking at reauthorizing that but law. This, dire this directive is, n this, this standard is not from a, f a federal mandate, is it? Yes, the federal mandate does say that you have to test your English language learners and within one year that they've been in the United States. However, how, what that test looks like in different states, what the standards and the criteria, everyone is under the same criteria for 2013, 100%. Some states have decided to go fairly flatlined with their expectation, then jump at the end. Some people indicating that they're waiting for a change in the law, and they'll just write it out until they're right close to it. You know, I suppose it's a Russian roulette any way you play it. So you certainly are right that as a board, you could direct us to provide additional input, uh, we, which we have been giving consistently. Uh, the uh, No Child Left Behind and the federal government have encouraged that we must have only research-based programs. Our question in this case is, where is the match of research-based programs to the research and the expectations for students that are English language learners? We have some of that same concern in some of the areas, other areas that we'll share as well. Have we education. asked the question, why are we not testing our students on their progress rather than on a set performance level? We've asked that. We've asked for student group sizes to be a percentage instead of a set number. Uh, so I think we've provided excellent input. Uh, Mary serves on the state assessment uh, uh, group, and she gives input consistently to the State Department. The State Department often indicates that they have asked uh, the federal government for a change or a difference in approach and have indicated that the federal government has not approved that. Uh, so I think this is certainly uh, a concern across the United States. And I think with what some of the things you'll hear from us on the next few slides, you'll see that that, uh, that concern is not only with English language learners, but some other groups as well. I would just add that the KELPA assessment is, um, the Kansas English Language Proficiency Assessment is designed to measure progress from year to year on those skills that are um, specific to an ELL student. I will tell you, however, though, we are in the second year of field testing that at the state level. They still don't have it cleaned up well. We just received the data um, as a cleanup piece from them this week to even begin looking at, and I can tell you right now from what I'm seeing, it's a mess. And so it is um, another measure, but yet not a clean measure. But if it can ever get to the point where it is a good measure, we might be able to see some progressive kinds of things there. So. We also certainly do other testing to validate progress in English. I mean, that's very important to us as well as, well as reading. But this kind of testing, I, I don't know what it proves to us at the end of the year with Carolina. I believe the student you were talking about there, testing her at the end of grade 11 with the grade 11 test. Uh, I don't know what it will prove, except we could probably guess already what her score might be on that assessment. Mr. Parker, I think you raise a valid point that I think this board should respond to this issue as a board not just through staff, even though I think it's important through staff and our superintendent about our concerns over this issue, because as I look at this, if the standard remains, there aren't enough resources to meet that requirement. I mean, there's not enough hours in a day or people or money, disagree with me if you will, to meet that standard in my view. You know, one year after someone's in this country, they're required to take the test at the same level as their peers. It makes no sense. Plus, if we're asking for data to drive instruction, this is not valid data. So it really does not right. drive the kind of instruction that we want to use with that student or with any of the students in special education. My understanding is, and I'm sure you're going to report on this, only a certain number of students can take the CAM. So then you look at the alternative for other students. Um, so there's, there are many questions many with our questions. subgroups that have to be answered, and I think as a large district, we probably have a responsibility, like Mr. Parker said, to, to start looking at a leadership role in some action. Well, I think as we provide some of the next pieces of information, it may add to the information that you would like to share with both the state government and the federal government related to No Child Left Behind. Ms. Aragon Dugan, our uh, director of special education, is going to talk about some of the changes and challenges related to testing our special education students. Good evening. Uh, in a similar vein of some of the challenges faced for English language learners 
Um, certainly students with disabilities are faced with some similar challenges come assessment time. I did want to tell you there are some special tests that a small number of students with disabilities uh, can take in the state of Kansas. One is called an alternative assessment uh, and the other is called CAM which is the Kansas assessment for multiple measures and this really is for our students with the most severe disabilities um, and these are two alternative assessment methods for them. Um, and uh, uh, Ms. Wilhelm mentioned already that we as a district are penalized if too many students take these two tests. Is that a percentage? It is or, a percentage. It's a percentage? Yes, for the alternative and just one more line down there. Regardless if they need the assessment or not, IEP teams determine whether or not a student with disabilities <laughs> needs to take a certain assessment. But the state, and then based on federal mandate, have determined what the limit on that is. So only 1% of our total student population can take what's called the alternative, and then only 2% can take that Kansas assessment for multiple measures, okay? If, in fact, a student needs the alternative but exceeds our 1%, they automatically, no matter how they scored on that assessment, fall into that academic warning category. Then the same is true on the CAM. Even if a student needs it and takes it, if we have too many students taking it, regardless of how who's left performed, they fall into that academic warning category as well. And what's the logic behind wanting to have that, that uh, limitation? Um, I, uh, I, I would love to be able to tell you that I thoroughly understand the logic. I think part of it from a special ed standpoint, because when IDEA was reauthorized just recently, they again support No Child Left Behind because of the accountability it brings to students with disabilities. That it says that the majority of students with disabilities we should absolutely be giving assessments to, we should know how they're doing, we should hold them to high standards. What I think someone, somebody, somebody has missed the boat is these numbers aren't appropriate and these expectations are unrealistic and I think do a great disservice to students and families, especially our severe students. So is a concern, uh, for lack of better words here, you have to excuse my terminology, okay. that if we were to put students through that alternative assessment that we would be taking someone the easy way out or an easier way out, or it's a, is it an easier assessment? Uh, it's a different assessment. It's certainly a performance-based assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the students taking this are students that work on only functional curricular skills, and it's based right off their IEP. So for them, is it an easy assessment? Absolutely not. Um, is it more likely that we're going to see progress because they're discrete skills? Absolutely. Is it a more appropriate assessment for a student with severe multiple disabilities? It is. If, if that's the fear that too many would take that, that's a possibility, I don't know. Yeah, and I didn't want to imply it was easier for them, but that the perception might be that it would be easier, or that we would be able to tailor it more for success outcome. Certainly. Yeah. And I think what we're questioning is not so much that all special education students would certainly take the alternative assessment or the CAM assessment, but that a higher percentage based on our student population, if they are appropriate to take these assessments, should have the opportunity to do that show what they've learned and progressed on, not on something that's unrealistic to them. And we'll share a little story in a minute that I think will illustrate that as okay. well. Sure. Important. Go ahead. Give me an idea of what percentage of students we have that would, I mean, what's our percentage of students that what we would like to see taking these tests? What we believe probably yeah. need this right. type piece? It's IEP determined. This is the big challenge is that IDEA is about individual decisions that IEP teams make. And No Child Left Behind is about grouping all these people into a subgroup, and so those don't balance well together. But I would say anywhere between 4 and 5% would be needing that. We do an incredible job, and I'll show you in this next slide. Keep in mind, the largest percentage of our students with disabilities very fairly take the general assessment. Some need some accommodations, other, others take it. But we're very concerned and are challenged about those that need something different and are unable to take it. Um, and you've seen us uh, similar comments. Recently received word uh, at late August that there were approximately over uh, 1,800 students with disabilities across the state of Kansas that were reclassified <coughs> under this penalty type system as uh, being academic warning. It impacted 103 districts in the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have a significant impact in a lot of places. Um, uh, it's not going to affect Olathe because we were diligent. The assessment office, our teachers, were diligent to make sure that we weren't impacted and really worked within the limits of the 1 and the 2%. Um, but do we feel we have students that IEP teams felt probably could have used that level of appropriate assessment? We do. Um, with that, I'm gonna, Dr. Manikowski's got a poignant story she's going to share that I think sheds more light personally on the situation. 
Well, I'm going to share just a little bit of a letter that went to Dr. Poggio, who is the head of the Center for Educational Testing uh, in the state of Kansas and has that contract with the Kansas State Department of Education. And just to kind of summarize as you kind of lay your eyes and glance on that, uh, this is a, a parent of a child that has Down syndrome and uh, felt that her, that was a pretty typical EMH child, and of course in fifth grade was given at that time called the modified reading as assessment, uh, partly because she was probably over the 1% uh, that was allowed to take uh, the different kinds of tests. Questioning and wondering why, you know, here at the end of June we get a letter that indicates our child is under satisfactory category. We could have told you that before she took the test. And that, you know, certainly we wouldn't expect a child who is Down syndrome reads at the first grade level, and we think that's a celebration, uh, can't read or comprehend material at the fifth grade level. Again, we could have told you that before the child took the test. And then the parent is asking, finally, I know that you've done a lot of research on No Child Left Behind, the Kansas Assessment Program. But again, asking us to take another look at that as a State Department, as a federal government, that we are asking students to do something that is insulting in, for some students, totally impossible for some students, and very degrading to many of our parents who understand where their children are, understand the progress they have made, and then why test them according to that. And I always like to throw a little picture of Hannah in here, uh, because you can see by looking at Hannah, very happy child, very thrilled that she's reading at the first grade level, but very inappropriate appropriate that she was tested on the grade, uh, grade 5 uh, Kansas reading assessment. So that just brings a little bit to life, a little piece of that. Well, the other change that has occurred is on group size. And uh, we certainly we know that we have several groups uh, that we might have to disaggregate or pull out their scores and look at sev separately. You can see those groups there listed for you, poverty, special education, English language learners, uh, ethnicity or minority categories. Uh, very often you hear this mentioned in the literature as subgroups. We're a little bit offended by the word subgroup, and so we just call them student groups here. But you can see uh, Mary talk a little bit about our group size and how it's changed in Kansas. Last year, you may recall, uh, when we talked about our student group size, uh, students with disabilities, we could have 40 within a student group um, as a size and 30 for all other student groups. Uh, recently, um, actually about three weeks ago, we discovered that 30 would be the subgroup size or student group size for all groups. When we look at the student group size and how that impacts us with AYP, um, it, it really does impact us in many ways because many of these students could be in multiple student groups. You could have a student um, in three of the different student groups, and we'll show you in just a minute a slide that shows uh, the number of student groups that we have at each of the different levels. Um, as you look at the information across um, our district, you can see, for example, um, at our elementary level, we have 16 schools that have a free and reduced lunch subgroup. However, you may recall we only have 10 Title I schools, um, and those schools, when we think about Title I, are predominantly um, Title I because of the status of free and reduced lunch uh, population that is served there. Yet, but you can see we have actually 10, we have actually six more schools that have a free and reduced lunch subgroup. The subgroups are combined across grade levels. So for example, students in grades 3, 4, 5, and 6, if there are 30 students that receive free and reduced lunch, or we have 30 special education students in grades 3, 4, 5, 6, or at the junior high level, grades 7 and 8 combined, uh, that would constitute a subgroup. And so you can see many of our buildings have student groups. Um, and you can see the complexity. Some of our buildings have student have as many as five student groups. Uh, some have as many as 10 if you look at both reading and math. Uh, what you see in front of you, though, is just information uh, for the groups as a whole uh, in terms of what we have. I might add also, as you uh, re reiterate, really, what um, uh, Ms. Matthew said is the fact that some students score, if I'm an English language learner student, I'm a Hispanic student, I'm on free and reduced lunch, my score will count three times for each of those individual groups. And, and that's something that, is, that we've been talking with different individuals, that that was something new to them that they had not realized. So you can see Dr. student Manikowski, groups so, important. So a student that is not in a subgroup, their score counts once. Yes. For the well, if you, I'm a, uh, I could be in the white category that is pulled out as a student group, and I could be in the all student category. So oh. I could influence actually more than I just said. Uh, ELL student also score would be ELL Hispanic free and reduced lunch, and I would also be in the all student score. So I'd actually in that case, I'd example before times that my score would count. 
So again, that's a, an important piece for us to look at. I Dr. know several Dr. of you have... Dr. Ald just whispered to me, but I think it's a great statement. If you can't speak the language at that level, you're affecting all those scores yes. across all those subgroups. Yes, that is true. Which is, I think, the major point we're trying to make here. I have a question before you go on. I noticed on the slide a couple slides ago that we had the, the State Department had requested 40 for the student groups, and it was denied by the Federal uh, Department of Education. You know, you've heard wild stories about what other states are doing under the 50 different plans that Mr. Parker was talking about. Has the federal government started to crack down on that uniformly across all the states? Yes, supposedly. However, we're still seeing some discrepancies in other states. Well, I know there were pretty wild variations There's, initially. Uh, in some for of example, plans. one state had 200 in their special education subgroup. I think that we would like to have updated information now that the federal government has again looked at the states, and um, we're hoping to work with our National Education Association does a lot of data collecting on this so that we can get another comparison. It will help us as we discuss with state and federal officials some of the concerns related to that. Uh, student group size in the state of Kansas, for some schools, 30 in a particular student group, they will never have that many. And uh, in talking with several individuals from the uh, Kansas State Department of Education, they said we set the number low because we wanted more schools to be impacted so that they would uh, ensure that all their students were learning. And in some ways, we had very much argued that we'd like to see it a percentage of the population. Because for some school districts, 30 is still not low enough when that's all the number of students they might have in the entire district. Are there any so, states who do have a percentage, or is it always a numerical number? It's a numerical number. We keep encouraging a, a percentage. Okay. Piece there. Well, let us kind of tie you up here and um, move right quickly. The other question that has been raised many times is the standard of excellence, and that again has not been released. And you can see we've just had released the performance bands, the scores to achieve those score performance bands, the AYP, so all of this is new. Again, standard of excellence coming. Well, I just want to. You had the uh, hear standard a of ex Mr. excellence Parker. highlighted in red. Was that a significant? Just to let us know that that has not been released yet. We don't know uh, what that will be. What the, what the score, what the, the cutoff state, is The going State to be Department has not set that yet, so we'll be anxious to hear what that is. One of the things that uh, is often asked is what happens if you do not make AYP? And certainly you can uh, fail AYP or not make AYP as a district or as an individual school or both. Uh, if you do that two years in a row, you do not make adequate yearly progress as set by the state. Uh, you would be put on improvement. Uh, that will not be for any of us because we uh, did not have that situation last year. But other districts and schools in the state of Kansas will be placed on improvement this year, even though it is a completely new test and new uh, expectations. Uh, certainly a school could eventually, and a district could eventually lose their accreditation because in the state of Kansas, they chose to intertwine accreditation and AYP. You might remember last year that 11 districts did not make AYP and 18 schools did not make AYP across the entire state of Kansas. Um, we've uh, already heard that uh, that could be as many as one-third of the school districts in Kansas will not make AYP this year based on some of the new information and regulations. So you might ask, where are we now? We're in preliminary. We have been provided some preliminary data that is being verified and corrected. And I quoted this a little bit from a memo we just recently received from the Kansas State Department of Education that uh, they're having an awful lot of cleanup across the state. We're very fortunate. We have a department that is really detail-oriented and trying to make sure our data is clean, but we even have errors. And that's because the KIDS system, which is the new database system which you've heard about, and the Center for Educational Testing aren't always co combined. They're not always talking to each other. There are coordination and programming issues. So that, uh, with that opportunity, they've extended the fact that how long you could appeal. And appeal means that we have a student in our district that shouldn't be in our district. We have a student categorized in a student group that shouldn't be in that student group. All that cleanup, and in a district our size, you can imagine what of a mammoth effort that is for Ms. Matthew, her staff, as well as individuals in the school. We will provide that data, of course, to you as soon as it is uh, released to us uh, and verified and corrected. Uh, the staff does have initial data, and I think the most important data they actually had was what Mrs. Wilhelm talked about, this instructional data. 
Which objectives were we the lowest on? Which ones did our kids do well on? So that we are changing our teaching practices, looking at different lessons as we look at those objectives and skills that we need to do a little bit better on. Certainly we know that we have continued work to do. And we would also say that based on the changes, uh, the likelihood of us as a district and some of our schools making AYP, uh, the likelihood is probably great that we will not make AYP in some of those areas as you heard those changes. We know we have continued work to do, especially with our students with disabilities, our English language learner group, and we will continue to work on that as well at the same time working on the middle students and the upper students in advancing and accelerating their, um, their areas of learning. We have a goal. We want all our students to meet proficient. Uh, no, it's meet standard now. Uh, recent change there. We want to close the achievement gap. We have every intention of doing that. We want to increase the achievement for our challenge learners. But at the same time, we know we have to increase access for students in the middle and at the top for advanced and accelerated coursework. We have much work ahead of us. And we wanted to end with one thing. We recognize that this No Child Left Behind in AYP has a great impact on students and uh, adults uh, as teachers, as principals, as board members, as parents and community members. But we also want to say probably the greatest impact is on children. Children who can be identified as a group and be looked at and say, oh my gosh, you're in that group that didn't help us achieve AYP. You're in the group that didn't score well enough. And we find that there could be great ramifications for children, and we want to very much guard against that, use our guiding principles, and make sure that students are not penalized again in recognition of the fact that they happen to be in a student group that may not have made AYP. So with that, a long, lot of details and a lot of information, but hopefully an opportunity for you to be brought up to date again on some of the current changes that have occurred in AYP and some of the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panikowski. Any other comments or questions, board members? Mr. Churchman? Yeah, Mr. Gilmer, first of all, I agree with uh, your thoughts and those of Mr. Parker as well. I think that uh, we need to be very strategic in how we go about that, and we need to provide with that some very detailed options or recommendations, and I'm confident that staff has those types of things. I also believe that will have to be a relentless effort, as one charge up the hill won't get it done, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Dr. Drummond? I was going to say just another excellent report, and uh, I'm reflecting back when Dr. George brought in the 2,000 pages or whatever it was, and we kind of walked through that in a summary fashion several years ago, and the very things we talked about then are beginning to rear their ugly heads, and we're beginning to see that in a very concrete way. And I would just continue to suggest that we advocate with our federal folks. In particular, we begin to work even more intentionally with our uh, National School Board organization and their advocacy groups because they have a lot of clout on Capitol Hill, National Education Association as well, and of course through our own uh, Kansas Association of School Boards. I think those groups together share the common interest that we have, and I think we need to jump into that uh, full force. Not that we haven't. I think we've advocated from day one, uh, uh, but it takes a lot to change what has happened at this point, so we just cannot, for the sake of our kids, give up very easily on this. So. Yeah, I think we have been advocating for a long time, but the progress has con the, the process has continued, and we get closer and closer to that 2013 date. Yep. And the fact that many schools and districts are not going to meet this AYP, and that's coming to fruition. And, and that, then what do that we do? may be what it's going to take in order for a change right. to occur tragically. So, as well, I think our other silent advocates certainly are our parents. This is a community that that supports education so well. And so it, it may be that we need to take an, a stronger initiative to educate our parents as it becomes more aware of what the needs of the district are or what the perceived needs of the district are with our subgroups. And um, even the understanding and, and, and our teaching and learning group have given us so much information about No Child Left Behind, about meeting AYP, and yet uh, the understanding of the public may be not what we're, where we want it to be yet. So um, there's certainly an advocate for education in so many ways. I don't think they want us to relinquish the excellence that's there in this community, that's even there in the state. You know, we could take a look at other states and go that direction, but I don't think that's what we necessarily want to do. Um, instead, to take a look at um, how the support can be to look at the subgroups and, and have a broad approach to how we go about the support of this. Great. Dr. Rall? One of the things that I think we can do is um, be specific in those areas that don't really make sense. That is, advocate for progress testing on students with 
special needs and um, language um, issues. Um, I think there's some very targeted areas that make sense. And I think the we've got a special education site council. We have some other vehicles that we can maybe go and talk to and, and get some more information. But it's got to be something doable. And I guess a question I'd have for um, Dr. Heinen or Dr. Benikowski is, uh, for example, on the assessment of um, special education children, that 1%, that 2%, is that federal controlled or is that state controlled? Special education. For alternative assessments, how many? Yeah, in fact, uh, I, I have to give some kudos to Kansas that we were one of the first states to step out and have alternative and modified assessments. There was a time that the, state, uh, the federal government was uh, deciding whether or not we could even retain those as a state. With our qualifications, they believed that we, we could go ahead and retain those, and other states have since added alternative and modified assessments. But there was a time period we thought those would go away as well. So there is a requirement by the federal government as far as the ceiling on that number. But again, it's sometimes a little difficult to have clarity on finding something written that says the 1%, 2%. So okay. we, I think we have to continue to question. Okay. okay. So those would be the kinds of things we would look at that might be um, specific because I think part of the problem is trying to get our arms around this to even communicate with somebody where do you go because the law is there and uh, we're not going to impact the entire legislation I don't think right away but if we could pick some of those key things that really make the least sense to the for to common sense uh, and work on that so we'll try to do that and bring something back and I do think the voice of the board um, at that level brings um, a, a heightened uh, sense of concern and I, I think that would be appreciated. Great. Well, excellent report. Thank you ladies very much. That's great information and, and well presented. Uh, before we take our break, the last item on this part of our agenda has to do with an uh, update on the Joint City Council and School Board meeting and we've placed it on the agenda for the purpose of just uh, reiterating for the benefit of our listening public, viewing public, that we have had this joint meeting with our city council in the uh, middle of August. It was a very productive meeting, a good meeting where we learned from each other about our uh, common experiences and common challenges, which usually centers around the word growth for our community and our school district. And I just wanted to uh, put on the record here, and if you refer to the August 17th minutes that you have in your consent agenda, some things that the mayor summarized for us at the end of the meeting and that is together we will retain a commitment to an annual meeting to share information and discuss issues and find solutions that our city council liaison group which is uh, the uh, officers of the board and then the principal officers of the city council and the, and the superintendent and city manager will meet quarterly uh, as a group which we've been doing for a little while now our city manager and superintendent will meet to share information on building on our successes Department directors from city and school district will meet together and separately to work together. And city development services staff will meet quarterly with school planning staff to discuss growth issues, location of schools and infrastructure, parks and other facilities. Our city traffic staff will continue to work with school safety committee to discuss and review issues of traffic as it relates to schools. The city police department will continue to work closely on school resource officer program and, and the proposed cadet program. And finally, the city police department will work with school district staff on issues education and placement of school crossing guards and other alternatives and we and we know there's a lot we already do together behind the scenes but there's much more we want to be very proactive as a as two governing bodies in this community to work together as best we can to benefit our entire community and so unless there's other comments from board members we just wanted to put that on the record tonight uh, for the benefit of those who will hear this broadcast or see this broadcast uh, or who's sitting here tonight and we're not aware of that meeting Okay, with that, we will take our comfort break and reconvene at 7.15.